what has changed, you know, since the last time we talked? Uh, because this it's been a while and I haven't forgotten, but we've been in the midst of like Trump and uh, <laughs> racial injustice, which seems to be uh, constant. And this is part of the racial injustice, the environment and how we're treating it, correct? Absolutely. I think in a couple of ways. One is that, you know, the systems that cause racial oppression are the same ones that are driving the climate crisis, right? The, this over-exploitation of people, of resources, this is what is leading to the climate crisis. Um, and to say, you know, what has changed since the last time we've talked, I think what we see now is that we are in the midst of the climate change crisis. Um, it's no longer something that will happen in five years to 10 years. What we can anticipate is that it will get worse. I mean, this is just the beginning. So you can imagine how it will be Every year it's, you know, we have unprecedented, everything is unprecedented until we have to finally accept that this is just the way it is from now. Well, this is just the way it will be. I was uh, talking yesterday with uh, a doctor about COVID, like, and, and we had a guy, uh, Don Calloway, he said, is it possible that COVID is never going away? And she said, it may not be a pandemic, but it may be like the seasonal flu. But yes, it's probably never going away. The wearing of masks will probably become a way of life. We'll probably have to wear masks forever. Um, how do we navigate the environment? Because during the height of the pandemic last March for two months, it was like the earth could breathe, the animals <laughs> came back, the sky was blue, the waters cleared up. In just two months, no airplanes in the sky, everything seemed to clear up, no cars on the road. Two months, the earth was like, yay, yippee. And I said, man, that's, there's a possibility. Maybe we need to take a break every Earth Day for two months and just give the earth a break. I know people won't do that, though. So no. short of that, are there, <laughs> is there another solution? I mean, I think one thing that we should remember is that it's not too late, right? If we switch to renewable energy, if we stop burning fossil fuels, it's not too late to stop the worst impacts of the climate crisis. And I think something that's also instructive from what happened during the pandemic is that, you know, basically society stopped, but we actually only saw about a 16% reduction in, in greenhouse gas emissions. So, so much of it is baked into our systems and our structures that we really need to start thinking about how can we fundamentally change the way that these things work and these things operate. People don't want to wear a mask, Jamie Jim. <laughs> they, don't, they don't want to wear a yeah. mask to prevent the spread of a damn killer virus. You're telling people to do what exactly? Uh, not use plastic bottles? Like what, what are the three things everyone can do right now that would reduce dramatically the carbon footprint and help reverse some of the damage we're doing? So here's something that could be helpful is that I think we focus a lot on individual behaviors, but in fact, we need systems change. So we saw the best that we could do with individual behavioral change. And of course, people should live low carbon for, you know, lifestyles, you know, purchase electric cars if you can, don't buy plastic, all of those things. But in fact, we need structural change. You know, we can only do so much as individuals. And, you know, to be honest, the fossil fuel companies know that. They, that's why they've been pushing this message that individuals are the ones to blame. It's your fault. But of course, it's not our fault, right? It's these systems and structures that are causing these problems. So we need systemic change. And to be honest, one of the best things that we can do is vote and be politically active. We need different people in office so different decisions are made. Well, when, when people start talking about a Green New Deal, you know, it's like lib liberal blather and they're taking away our rights. When did the earth become a political football? When did, you know, right. living you know, on Mother Earth become political? I mean, I also think it's interesting to think about what rights are we taking away? The right to breathe polluted air? You know, if in a Green New Deal, the air will become clean, the water will become clean. I mean, I don't see, like, why are these bad things? And... You know, I think it's also helpful to think about who benefits when we think about environmental solutions as political. And, you know, it's fossil fuel industries, right? It's polluting industries. They're the ones that benefit from kind of driving this culture war. When we are all the ones, then when we are the ones that will suffer from it. When, you talk, fossil, from it. when you talk about fossil fuel, uh, the fossil fuel industry, that sounds like this amorphous, like, what is that? Get, get like day to day, how how do we interact with the fossil fuel industry? How are we acting or interacting individually or in our community? What what does that look like? When does when do when do they show up? I mean, it looks like when you put gas in your car. It looks like uh, when you turn on your electricity if you get power from either coal fired power plant or gas fired power plants. But also in small things, you know, plastics are made from that are a derivative of petroleum. So part of the challenge is that that fossil fuels are so embedded in our lifestyles. That's why we need change at a higher level than just the individual. 
you and I can only do so much, Karen. Like besides like going to live in the woods <laughs> with no, I mean, even then I think we still wouldn't be able to do it. Right. So right, we, really, everyone would, yeah. we need these structures to change. Yeah. It's why I read a story yesterday that Coca-Cola is moving to a pl- uh, paper based uh, cup, uh, bottle for their Coca-Cola. And I was like, ah, that's major. You know, if, if a major company like Coca-Cola is making a shift to stop using plastic and instead pr- producing a paper biodegradable version for their Coca-Cola, that's going to make a significant impact. So, you know, as consumers, if we start to support that, then it becomes profitable for the companies to do it, right? So we have to now right. be smart in our consuming to, to reward Coca-Cola for doing that instead of saying, ugh. <laughs> this looks weird because it does, it does right. look, it looks different than that cool bottle that, that we were used to seeing. And I don't drink soda, so I don't care. <laughs> the other. I mean, I care, care. Uh, but, you know, I brought you on because, you know, there's a lot of, of talk of, you know, Greta Thunberg, people were, um, you know, trolling her for, you know, for making this an issue because it does feel like for, for this Rucker nation that we live in, this idiocracy that we're under, this, you know, low information, you know, not the truth, you know, can be found in our media. Uh, it is hard to make the argument, you know, that what's happening in Texas and what happens in California and what ha- what's going to happen this summer with the hurricanes. And uh, it's hot, but it's also cold. How is that possible if it's global warming? How is the snow in Texas if it's global warming? Please just, uh, just really briefly explain to people why this is a climate control issue and not just uh, an anomaly. I mean, I think maybe a different way to think about it is global weirding. People get really caught up in like what is weather and what is climate, but in fact, we're experiencing global weirding. That's why it's snowing in Texas, right? That's why we have crazy heat waves. And I think something that is also helpful to think about is we're not going to face these new new situations per se. It's just that everything that we know will be worse. So hurricane season will be worse, droughts will be worse, heat will be worse, you know, cold will be worse, extreme weather will be worse. And that's all because we have these patterns of weather that are changing. When the earth is, you know, the temperature is increasing, it just throws everything out of whack. I think you can think about it a little bit like the human body. You know, when your temperature goes up two degrees, you actually become really sick. And that's kind of what's happening to our earth. The temperature has gone up and we, you know, the earth is really sick. Why, why did this become a, a passion of yours, Jamie Jen? Because you could have studied anything. Uh, <laughs> And why, it would have it would have been less depressing if I had studied other things, Karen. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know, I know. Yeah. You you chose this as a life, a life mission. Um, what was there a something that happened that you said I have to throw my might into researching and studying this? What what was that moment? I think there were a couple of moments. One is that you know we only have one Earth, so um, I don't believe that we can go to Mars. I I think maybe we could send Elon Musk to Mars, but I don't think we should live on Mars. Um, but the second was that, you know, the folks that were talking about the environment were really talking about like animal preservation or nature. And I think those are things are important, but you know, the environment really has a disproportionate impact on people of color and marginalized communities, right? We are literally poisoning people to get to death. You know, there's an area in Louisiana, it was called Cancer Alley. They renamed it Death Alley because it's the petrochemical hub of the country and people are just dying because there's so much pollution. And I feel like, you know, when you know that, you, can't, I, you, you have to do something about it. I don't know. Like, there's, we can't just, I don't know. You, I just don't, you know, how do you know that? And then just decide to not do anything and say, well, that's just the way it is. I mean, if we don't make the world different, who will, who will make the world different? And how do you feel as one person that you, you know, it's like I look at the Greta Thunbergs and the, and the, and the U's, the Jamie Jinchas, and I'm like, how do you believe that one, you know, one person you know, beating this drum can change, you know, and again, I go back to folks didn't want to wear, still don't want to wear a mask during a pandemic. It gets a little hopeless when you see, you literally could save people's lives if you just wore a mask. It's not for you, it's for the people. And folks don't want to do that and they get mad and they feel like their rights are being infringed upon. So this, you're telling them, oh, we want everyone to live. (laughs) Pay attention. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I have to say it's not easy and I don't mean to make it sound as if it is, but I kind of think the only way that we know things won't change is if we don't try. So we have to try and I'm not alone. I'm here with you, for instance. And, uh, you know, we, 
it's, and that's how it starts. You know, one person becomes two people, becomes 10 people, becomes 100 people, and then it becomes 1,000 people. Um, and I think, you know, little by little, we don't all have to, you know, I don't wish this life on anybody. We don't all have to like devote our lives to climate change, but we can all care. And as long as you care about someone else besides yourself, I think that's where we start. You mentioned the uh, place in Louisiana. Give us a couple of other horror stories, uh, climate related, that that people are suffering so that we can get a, a sense of what's yeah. really happening. I mean, I think Texas is really such a, a example right now. You know, it's a state that they're not, part of the problem is that because the weather is so weird, they're not used to weatherization. So they don't, their houses are not built for cold. They don't have good heaters. And then you start to see how it becomes this like snowball effect because then your pipes freeze. So that means that the water bursts, your home becomes unlivable, but it's not just your home, right? It's a restaurant. It's not like you can then go someplace where that's warm and can eat because the electricity has, is out for the entire region or the entire area. Um, you know, this, when, this summer in California, we, ha we have wildfires naturally, but this level of wildfires, I live in Los Angeles. It was like we were camping outside because the air was smelled so much like burning trees. Um, and then you can, these things will just get worse. Um, and, but I just, again, reiterate, it's not too late. Uh, you know, if we kind of correct course now, we can stop the worst impacts of the climate crisis, which means also we have to understand that what we're seeing now, this is not the worst. It can get much, much worse, but we can stop it from getting much, much worse, which is what we have to do. The legislation, uh, legislation that's out there, um, you know, we talked about the Green New Deal. Who is you know, a politician that we can get behind that's really rocking it out, in your opinion, as she picks up her swell, you know, because she's not, she's not Reusable drinking out of plastic. Bottle. Yes, <laughs> I see you. I see you. Um, you know, because for, for us sitting here, sometimes I don't know who to support and I don't know who's doing, you know, great things. Uh, is there a website that we can go to where we can read up on it and get, you know, 101 for folk who don't know what's going on with the climate? Is there a space that we can go to? Um, and then what are the politicians, who are the politicians that we can support and put our might, even if we don't live in those states mm -hmm. who are actually doing a good job in your opinion? I mean, I think lots of people would probably, you know, disagree, but I think Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is one of the most inspiring leaders that we have. And mainly because one, she's not afraid to be bold. And what we need now is people who are not afraid to be bold and ambitious, right? We're not going to solve this problem by incremental steps. And more than that, she also understands that, you know, racial inequality, social inequality, and climate inequality, they're all linked. So we can't just address one of them. We have to address them all. And we can address them all. Um, you know, in terms of where to start, I think there's lots of organizations that are doing great work. Um, I'm on the board of this organization called the Center on Race, Poverty, and Environment. And they do a great job of kind of helping people understand, you know, what it is like to live in a fossil fuel industry, what a uh, region and what is, you know, the challenges that are facing farm worker communities or communities of color. But I think the other thing is that is helpful is to get involved locally. Like there's so much great work being done at the local level that wherever you live, you know, you just have to Google environments and climates and there will be a group that pops up. Um, and I think, you know, we can make so many changes on the local level that it often gets overlooked. And, you know, we can point to how successful the right has been in taking over state houses that, you know, and all these really regressive actions that are being passed at the state level that we could do the same, you know, if we just paid attention. I've been saying that for, forever. Um, you know, like they're not special. They just are focused right. and they move right. as a unit, even if they don't like each other. We watched this with the, with the Senate uh, acquitting Donald Trump because it was politically expedient. Half them people can't stand Donald Trump. And if it were a secret ballot, they probably would have voted to, to convict him. But because they recognize politically that there's strength in numbers and they got to move even Mitch McConnell, who came out with this, you know, this, uh, you know, dressing down of Donald Trump, voted to acquit him. So clearly, you know, voting your interests, your political power is always going to be at the forefront. So we have to move accordingly as well. I want to get back to this race thing because as, as black people, you know, I, I, oh, I was just telling somebody off mic, I'm fatigued. You know, we have to fight to keep the knee off the neck, to keep our 12 year olds from being shot, from keeping the traffic stops turning into killing, you know, Sandra Bland, to, to be in our home and feel safe without no knock warrants, you know, um, to be able to run freely and look at a, a you know, a, 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 a home site and be able to make it home, you know, in this country, the, those are the, the things that I feel, you know, when I'm driving, I'm not concerned about the environment as much as if there's a cop behind me, is this going to go left? Am I going to, you know, end up, 
you know, like Philando Castile and others. How do we then make room for the environment? You know, what's, what's the intersection, we keep talking about intersectionality of this, you know, social, racial and environment. Where, where does it show up and then how do we navigate that? Mm -hmm. You know, I think there was a lot of really great work done by uh, climate advocates of color this summer about this idea of I can't breathe, right? So a lot of black folk can't breathe because of the knee on the neck, but they also can't breathe because they live in these polluted communities. Um, George Floyd, for instance, had asthma, you know, and Eric Gardner had asthma. These are all, you know, it, health problems that come from living in polluted environments. And I think, you know, another thing to think is that, you know, we're not alone, that it's, this shouldn't be something that only black folk care about, only black folk carry, right? We have to show solidarity. This is a, a cancer on our society that needs to be excised, that we all need to care about, we all need to center, and we all need to advocate on behalf of.